On this edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at Listen to the Voice of God. That's who the devil is. He's an accuser. He's the one when we fall who said, oh, look at you. You're such a bad person. You can't be forgiven. You're no good. That's the voice of the enemy. We need to silence that voice. We need to not listen to that voice. We need to listen to the loving, compassion voice of God who wants to heal us, to take us tenderly into his arms. Tonight I want to speak about something very practical and very specific. I want to speak about how to get back on your feet, how to get up after you've fallen, after you've fallen into sin. Brothers and sisters, the road to holiness is checkered with many falls. And the ability to get up quickly after you've fallen, the ability to, to maintain your peace quickly after you've fallen. The ability to get back on the journey quickly after, you're fall, after you've fallen is essential in the spiritual life. As a matter of fact, many of the masters of the spiritual life have said that it's, it's in fact a sign of holiness. The person who after he or she falls is able to quickly get up and keep going and maintain his or her peace, that's a sign of maturity and holiness. In Proverbs chapter 24 verse 16, it says, though the just fall seven times, they rise again, but the wicked stumble from only one mishap. The just, they fall, but they rise again. We need to be able to do the same. In Micah, Chapter 7, verse 8, it says, Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. Though I have fallen, I will arise. And we too, we need to be able to say this. It's essential in the spiritual life. To be able to say, though I have fallen, I will arise. Are you able to say that? So again, uh, uh, how do we get up again? How do you get up when you've fallen? You've, you've fallen into sin. You've done something shameful. You're, you're, you're filled with, with, with regret. You feel awful. The devil of there, of, is there, of course, and he's happy. He's happy that you're down, and he wants to keep you down. As a matter of fact, he wants to bring you even deeper down. He wants to bring you deeper down through despair, hopelessness, confusion, condemnation, and all kinds of other miserable things. That's what the devil wants. How do we arise? What I want to share tonight is I want to share with you seven steps. Seven steps how to get back up on your feet quickly. Okay? Step one. Step one, when you fall, the first thing you need to do is run to God. That's step one. Run to God. It's counterintuitive. When we sin, we feel ashamed. And what do we want to do? We want to hide from God. Don't do that. That's what our first parents did, Adam and Eve. When they fell, right away they hid from God. We need to do the opposite. We need to run to God. We need to put ourselves in His light. We need to begin immediately a dialogue with God. You see, again, the devil, he wants us to be afraid of God. What I do when I, when I fall, what I like to do is I like to go right to God. I like to go to God and say, God, here I am, and I'm guilty. And I'm not hiding from you, Lord. Here I am, I'm guilty, and you go ahead and punish me according to your will. Your will be done, Lord. Whatever your will is, go ahead and do it, Lord. And you know what the Lord does? He hits me with a wave of his love and compassion. You see, again, the devil, he doesn't want us to run to God because he knows when we run to God, God will heal us. It's the first thing we need to do. Run to God. Step two is remember that God loves you. Oh, how easily we forget. Remember that God loves you. Not only does He love you, God, He's attracted to sinners. You know, when Jesus walked the face of the earth, He loved to go right to the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the, the sinners. He'd go to them. Why, does, why is God attracted to sinners? 
because he's a healer and he loves to heal. And if he can find someone he, he can heal, he'll go right to that person. Again, God loves us. He made us. He's, attract, he, he, he's attracted to our brokenness because he wants to heal us. There are so many examples in scriptures. We need to know them and remember them. The story of the prodigal son. The son who demands his share of the inheritance and he goes and he squanders it all and he decides to go home and hopefully maybe his dad will let him be a slave and from a distance his father sees him, his father runs to him, he embraces him, kisses him and throws a party because his son is home. That's the love of our father. That's the love God has for sinners. The story of the woman who was caught in adultery, thrown at the feet of Jesus. What does Jesus do? What does he say? He says, I don't condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. The thief on the cross next to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, he said to Jesus. What did Jesus say? He said, this very day you will be with me in paradise. That's the love of our God. The love he has for sinners. The story, the parable of the shepherd who had a hundred sheep. He leaves his 99 sheep and he goes after the lost. That's the love our God has for the lost, for the broken, for sinners. Peter, the one who was so close to Jesus, he denied Jesus three times. And what did Jesus do when he saw him next? He said, Peter, do you love me? He didn't condemn him. He didn't accuse him. Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. We know that. John chapter 3, verse 17. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. That's our God. That's the one we run to, even after we've sinned. Now, who's the one who accuses us? Who's the one who condemns us? It's the evil one, it's the devil. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, it says, For the accuser of our brothers is cast out, who accuses them before our God day and night. That's who the devil is. He's an accuser. He's the one when we fall who said, Oh, look at you. You're such a bad person. You can't be forgiven. You're no good. That's the voice of the enemy. We need to silence that voice. We need to not listen to that voice. We need to listen to the loving, compassion voice of God who wants to heal us, to take us tenderly into his arms. God's love for us is not conditional. It's not all like God says, listen, you were really good yesterday, so yesterday I loved you a lot. But today you haven't been doing as good, so I don't love you as much today. That's what's called conditional love. God's love is not conditional. He loves us no matter what even in our sins, even in our brokenness. Why? Again, because we're his sons and daughters. Again, when we've sinned, we need, to, we need to remember his love. We need to receive his love. Step number three. It's very good when we've fallen to take a moment and to remember and to, 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 to have a little reality check to remember our fallen human nature. It's healthy to remember that. Weakness, brokenness is part of being a fallen human being. Every one of us, all of us, fall into sin. Amen? Yeah. We all fall into sin, and it's good to remember that. You think I'm giving this talk based on theoretical knowledge? We all know what it's like to sin. We all know what it's like to have to get up again. And it's good for us to remember that, to have that healthy reality check. Welcome to fallen humanity. This step involves a humbling of ourselves a little. Oftentimes we're shocked. Oh, I'm shocked. I'm not perfect. You know, oftentimes in our shame, there's a subtle pride. A subtle pride we think to ourselves, how could I do something like that? And again, we have to be careful. We have to be careful of that. The truth is, we all need a Savior. We all need a Redeemer. We all need a Healer. 
Every one of us, brothers and sisters, is a work in progress. And we need to accept that. And I'm not talking about excusing sin, you know, pretending it's not there or pretending it's not a big deal. Sin is a big deal. But God's love and mercy is infinitely bigger than that. And so again, we need to have a healthy um, understanding. You know, when I, when I sin, I try, to, I try to say to the Lord, Lord, I've sinned and I'm not surprised. As a matter of fact, I'm surprised I don't sin more. I'm surprised you, you're so merciful to me that you give me so much grace that I don't sin more. But I'm not surprised that I've sinned because I know without you I can do nothing. And I thank you that I don't fall into to, to deeper sins. Again, we need to have a humble approach. We need to allow the Lord to humble us. We will continue with the teaching by Father Mark in just a moment. The Food for Life ministry is only made possible by the financial donations from you, our viewers. We ask that after the program, you prayerfully consider a tax-deductible financial donation to help us continue this Catholic television ministry. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. Thank you for your prayers and support. And now back to Father Mark Goring. Step number four. Step number four is to simply ask God to forgive you. To say to the Lord, Lord, I'm sorry. Will you please forgive me? And I encourage you, say that in your own words from your heart. And once you've done that, then I suggest you bring closure by praying an act of contrition. Or if you don't know the act of contrition, pray, you can pray Psalm 51. If you don't have a Bible, just pray the Our Father. Because in the Our Father, we pray, Father, forgive us our trespasses. And when we pray that, He does. Otherwise, He wouldn't have asked us to pray that prayer. Bring closure by praying a prayer like that. And then it's very important, don't do that again. I mean, when someone comes up to me and says, hey, I'm sorry for what I've done, would you please forgive me? And I say, yes, I forgive you. Well, if they come up to me 10 minutes later and say, oh, I'm really sorry for what I've done, would you please forgive me? I'd say, dude, I just forgave you. Don't you, don't you believe that I've forgiven you? It kind of hurts. And if the week later, oh, I'm really sorry for what I've done, would you f please forgive me? i say, hey, I've forgiven you. And it's the same with God. Tell him you're sorry. Make an act of contrition or something like that. And then receive his mercy. And then don't go on saying, oh, I'm so sorry. And then tell, I'm so sorry. You know, If anything, if you're still remembering how bad you feel about it, thank the Lord. Lord, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for your mercy. You know, this staying in self-pity, it just doesn't help any. And it's also not a good time after we've sinned to try to kind of figure out, like, why did I do that? And how can I do things different? And I need to come up with a strategy. And, you know, what went wrong? There is a time and a place to do that. But it's not right after you've sinned. Don't put yourself through, through that mental anguish. Just simply receive His mercy and go on. Again, if anything, just keep thanking the Lord for His mercy. Don't keep saying, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Step number five, now recommit yourself to the journey. Every one of us, brothers and sisters, we're on a journey towards the promised land. Jesus is the way, and we're walking with Him. And yes, this journey, it, it, it's, it's a hard road. It's a hard road, and yes, because we're a work in progress, we're going to fall again many times. But again, we need to, to recommit ourselves that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to continue on this journey. Even though the process of growing in virtue um, takes time, it's, it's a slow process, we grow little by little, I'm going to continue. And again, when the devil tries to discourage me or try to, tries to make me fall into discouragement, what I like to say to the devil, and this bugs him, I say to him, I say, you know what? I'm never giving up. I don't care if I fall a hundred more times today, I'm not giving up. I'm not giving up for the rest of this month, for the rest of this year, and for the rest of my life. I am going to keep walking on this journey. I'm going to keep trying for the rest of my life, no matter how many times I fall. And again, the devil can't stand that because, because we have confidence in God. And with that confident attitude and trust in God and perseverance, we'll make it. 
Jesus says in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, but the one who perseveres to the end will be saved. Step number six. Step number six is, six is now get up. Get up and carry on with your duty. Get up and do the things you need to do. Don't just kind of get up and, oh, I'm just going to feel sorry for myself. No, get up. And, and, and again, I'm, I'm being uh, specific. Do something. Get up. And, 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 and make lunch if that's your duty. Get up and do your homework if that's your duty. Get, get up and fold laundry. Whatever it is, do something. Continue on the journey and try to, to maintain your peace as you do this. Very intentionally, continue with the duties you need to do with peace in your heart and your soul. And then finally, step number seven. If you're Catholic, go to confession especially if it's a serious sin. If it's just a small little sin to the Lord, it, it, it might not be necessary. But if it's something serious, go to confession. Tell the Lord, say, Lord, help me to get to confession at the earliest reasonable time. You don't have to come knocking at my door at 3 in the morning. If you do, you're going to get a big penance. Okay? <laughs> but just say to the Lord, Lord, help me to get to confession as soon as possible, as soon as, as, soon as reasonably uh, possible. You know, Jesus gave his disciples authority to forgive sin. We see this in John chapter 20, verse 23. Jesus says, Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins are, you retain are retained. We know that the Lord, before you go to confession, he's already forgiven your sin, but he wants to seal that forgiveness in confession. Through the priest, the Lord makes you new. He wipes away all of your sins. He refreshes you in a wonderful sacramental way. And you leave confession feeling better. If you're not Catholic, I think it's still good to, to go to confession to someone. Maybe your pastor, maybe a mature um, Christian friend. Um, in James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. You know, to go to someone and say, hey, can you pray for me? I've been struggling with this. And have them pray for you. Again, you'll feel a lot better if you do that. And so these are the seven steps. Run to God. Remember His love. Receive His love. Accept your fallen humanity. Simply ask God to forgive you. Recommit yourself to the journey. Get up and carry on with your duty and go to confession. The masters of the spiritual life say that when we fall, if we run to God and allow Him to lift us up, our fall doesn't set us back, but rather it puts us ahead because we've had an encounter with God's mercy. So brothers and sisters, let these seven steps become a habit in your life. If you need to, you can, you can go to YouTube and listen to this teaching. And remember the seven, the, the seven steps God loves sinners. He loves you, even in your brokenness. You do not need to be afraid of your loving Father. Nothing can separate you from the love of, love of God. God loves you, and so have faith in Him and arise. You can watch this episode of Food for Life or previous episodes 24-7 anywhere around the world on YouTube. Just visit our website, foodforlifetvministry.org and click on Watch Now on YouTube. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at the Good Shepherd. I don't know if Jesus is saying that every single person would do that. Not every single person who is in charge of a hundred sheep would leave the 99 to go after the one. I want to speak about that.
Do you like westerns? I do, even though I haven't seen one in a while. But one of the neat things about a western are those frontier towns. Aren't they kind of neat? You know, you, you come in to this town, which is, you know, often in the middle of nowhere, and you come down the main street, you know, the street, and on your left you might see, you know, a bank with, you know, two levels and kind of a big front, followed by, you know, the general store, um, you know, with, with big windows and a porch and maybe rocking chairs. Um, or maybe the rocking chairs are on the front porch of the saloon across the street. And you go down the street and, and you see these great facades. But when you go into the buildings, or better still, go into the backyards, th there's nothing there. It's just, it's literally a front to your town. There's nothing there. It's all kind of an appearance, to give an appearance of something great and grandiose. Well, our lives can be like that. That we can have a great front, as it were. A great facade, a great presentation even. Where from the outside, we look like we've really got things together. And maybe that's our work. You know, we, we're very proud of our work and, and it's a very important part of who we are and how we're perceived. Or maybe it's our, our material well-beings. You know, we have a very nice home and, and a nice car and we look like we really have it together. Or maybe some of our relationships, you know, we're very proud of that. Maybe our, our spouse and our children. And, and, uh, but inside, inside there's just so much missing. There's, there's an emptiness. There's a lack of peace. Jesus spoke about this often. Jesus, when he spoke about the, the leadership of the day in his time, he, was, he did not mince words about the Pharisees, for example, who, for them, their front was their religious practices, that they were, uh, they were particularly meticulous about religious practice. And, and, and as a matter of fact, they had augmented um, a number of the religious practices. And yet Jesus despite their piety. Um, Jesus was very severe with them because he, he could read hearts. He knew that their heart, many of them, their hearts were in the wrong place. That while on the outside they performed very pious practices, that inside their hearts was impurity and hatred, which would have been manifested in their actions and how they, and how they treated people outside of their religious practices. And so the Lord wants to tear these fronts down. He wants to tear these facades down. Not just because they're unjust, but because they make us unhappy. That we, we have propped ourselves up with a wonderful presentation through the things that we do or the things that we have. And yet many of these things are in vain. Or we do them so that people will love us and care for us. And Jesus is saying, I want you to be free. I want you to be free from needing these things for your own self-worth and to get affirmation from others. Because they don't in the end. They, they don't give you the, the affirmation and the care and the peace that you're looking for. I want you to be free. So that's what Jesus does. Jesus comes into a frontier town and he says, all this must go. What Jesus does is, is he comes into a town and he builds it out. He places depth. Jesus goes in and he sees beyond the facade. That's why Jesus in Matthew 5 said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that maybe don't quite have the front and then don't quite have the facade. Blessed are those that maybe don't present so well. But behind the presentation is the kingdom of God because the poor in spirit have the kingdom of God. So Jesus is more about what goes on behind the scenes. Jesus is about 
what's going on inside the heart. So maybe take a few minutes today and ask the Lord, what is, give me one front, give me my main front that I hide behind. Give me that one thing where I take so much pride and pleasure and yet is not really bearing me that much fruit in terms of peace and joy and love and gentleness and all those other fruits of the Holy Spirit that St. Paul talks about in Galatians. So let's pray. Father, you've blessed us with so many things, Lord. But some of these things you've given us, Lord, we hide behind. They're our front. They hide what we really feel on the inside, which might be a deep sadness or a deep pride or an anger or vanity. And Lord, these things have not made us happy. We invest much energy in, in, in putting on a good presentation, and yet our hearts are far from love, and our hearts are far from you. So show us, Lord, our main front so that you can tear it down and set us free. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. It's our joy to serve you here on, on Food for Life. We know that many people are really blessed by our ministry here. I travel around Canada and, and, and speak with a lot of people who, who really are blessed by our, our ministry. And so we thank you for, for joining us on Food for Life. And once again, invite you to, uh, to support our ministry through, through your prayers and also your, your financial uh, gifts. Uh, the, the ministry, of course, relies on the financial support of our viewers. And so we, we just once again invite you to consider uh, making a donation to Food for Life Ministry so that we can continue this good work that the Lord has, has begun uh, here in, in Food for Life. Thank you and God bless you. You can watch this episode of Food for Life or previous editions 24-7 anywhere around the world on YouTube. Just visit our website, foodforlifetvministry.org, and click on Watch Now on YouTube. Food for Life is a nonprofit Catholic charity funded only by donations from viewers. To help us continue this Catholic television ministry, please send your tax-deductible donation to Food for Life, Box 1107, Station F, Toronto, Ontario, M4Y 2T8. To save postage, you may now make your donation online. Just go to our website and follow the link. We ask you to consider a regular monthly donation, either by post dated checks or through our website, to help us continue the Food for Life ministry. On the next edition of Food for Life, Father Mark Goring looks at the Good Shepherd. I don't know if Jesus is saying that every single person would do that. Not every single person who is in charge of a hundred sheep would leave the 99 to go after the one. I want to speak about that. We would like to thank you for your financial support of the Food for Life television ministry. Food for Life is funded only by viewers like yourself. We have no commercial sponsors. Your tax-deductible donations help pay for production of the program, pay the television station for the time that the program is on the air, and pay for the mailing of our monthly newsletter. Thank you again for your support of this Catholic television ministry.